Okay, so I'm going to talk about the performance of um, um, highway and railway structures during the earthquake. Um, we had a pretty good team. We got along pretty well. It was me and Scott Ashford from um, Oregon State University. And we had a consultant engineer, um, Luis, from um, Venezuela. And um, we had a couple of engineers from um, Chile, both from the Catholic University. Rodrigo and Matias. And, um, you know, like what Keith was saying, it was a big earthquake, a long distance of travel. So we were in the car 16 hours a day together, and nobody killed each other. We all got along pretty well, so that must be um, a good um, Latin American temperament. They could stand my jokes or something. So, at any rate, so this is just like Keith was saying, um, a big area. So the fault is 540 kilometers. <laughs> that doesn't count on my time, does it? No. So anyway, we got 540 kilometers in length and 200 kilometers deep. And so what our team did was on the first day, we just took off from um, Santiago and we drove south 700 kilometers and spent the night at Temuco. And then we looked around the area south of the fault and then slowly made our way back up. So actually, we never did cover the area along the coast um, north of the epicenter. We hope that um, there's two teams coming after us, um, the ASCE Teakley team. And um, Roy Imsen's going to be looking at bridges. So hopefully he'll be able to supplement what we got. And then also the FHWA, the Federal Highways team, is coming and um, with Ian Buckle from University of Nevada, Reno, and Phil Yen from FHWA. So I was the advanced team. What happened is um, most of the roads have been given to um, private, private companies, and so they were in a hurry. They had to remove the damaged roads and quickly put up new roads so they could have income just to pay off their bonds. So um, um, they sent me down with the first team to come right away and capture as much damage as we could. And then there'll be two um, cleanup teams after us. I just wanted to mention, um, you know, everybody was talking about um, what a big fault it was. And, um, you know, there was an article in the New York Times by um, um, Peter Yanoff about megaquakes. But to me, you know, magnitude is just based on area and slip, right? So this is a big area. So it's a big area that got shaken and maybe a lot of slip. But um, my impression was I didn't see it that much really strong shaking, you know, PGAs greater than 0.5G, spectral accelerations, you know, um, one and a half, two G. I didn't see that, at least my observations. I may be wrong, but that was my impression that this is like maybe the fifth or sixth subduction type event we've been to. And uh, um, anyway, so I mentioned that's my friend Tom Chance at Caltrans, and he, you know, these attenuation models are based on um, data from earthquakes. And so Young's um, subduction model, I compared it to the campbell Borzonia um, crustal model. And you can see that um, both for PGA and at one second with distance, that um, crustal models just pr provide a lot more ground shaking. That's my, my opinion. And um, also, I've seen much, much more damage from um, crustal type earthquakes. But hopefully, we'll have some more discussion about that. So. Um, we, I asked Jack to, um, if he could provide the seismic code for um, Chile. And really, their code was um, sort of like our old um, seismic code um, based on what we, um, Caltrans observed after 1971. So because this earthquake to, for bridges mostly caused unseating, um, I looked at that portion of the code where it defines how you design your seat your seat at abutments and at bed caps and at hinges. And um, so you can see this one, it's just basically based on the amount of skew, the height of the column, and um, the length of the spans. So it's kind of a kludgy kind of equation that we used to use. Typically, well, you know, basically our, our design is different now. I mean, our basic design is we provide a fuse on the bridge. Both Caltrans and other states in the U.S., other states have adopted the Ashto guide specifications for LFD seismic bridge design. 
and it's all based on a fuse. So you provide a fuse that limits the amount of force in your structure. Then you design everything else in the structure to be stronger than that. That's our design. This you know, design with R factors and everything is sort of outdated. But my feeling is from what we saw that it wasn't used much. I think these private bridge owners weren't really doing much seismic detailing, but I guess we'll discuss that some more too. So um, anyway, oh, so I was going to say, so in our um, equation, it's based basically on the displacement of the two adjacent frames. So you've got two frames. You calculate what the displacement of each frame is. The largest possible would be if both frames are moving in opposite directions, but we give a slight break. We take the square root of some of the squares of the displacements and add it to a few other things to get our N, our seat width. So this earthquake for bridges was all about seat, and we're going to look about at how seats were damaged. So I have um, one, two, three, four, five, five locations we're going to look at, just quickly, I guess. So the first thing I want to talk about is overcrossings. So an overcrossing is a little bridge that goes over the highway. And so when you're driving Pan American Highway, they were fortunate that Pan American Highway was like 100 kilometers away from the coast, so it wasn't severely shaken because, you know, the subduction zone is diving down into the crust. By the time it got to um, Route 5, you know, the shaking probably wasn't that high. But these overcrossings, a good overcrossing designed with seismic details or even with the crummy details that's well seeded, Caltrans won't retrofit it because we have never seen any evidence of a bridge less than 300 feet well seated with end diaphragm or good um, I'm sure keys that ever collapsed during an earthquake. But um, we saw several from this bridge, um, from this earthquake, but we don't think that it was as well seated as we would have liked. So these overcrossings, they are um, two giant embankments and then a couple of spans of bridge. And typically they should be well seated in the abutment. And then typically the central pier or bent um, can't move enough to cause any damage. So that's our basic philosophy. However, you can see here that um, they had um, weak shear keys. And so the superstructure was allowed to move break through the shear key at the beginning of the earthquake. And so this wouldn't be a well-seated two-span overcrossing, and so all bets are off. Um, in fact, the weird thing about this, I, I think Jack was calling me on the first day while we were driving. He says, what's this about um, all these overcrossings twisting? And it was, it was a fact, and I don't know why we saw like a, six or seven of these overcrossings, and they all, they all rotated around the center of the bridge for some reason. And... Um, we typically design our bridges for longitudinal transfers, not for twisting. So one end is twisted in this way, at the other end is twisted in this way. And that was quite common. So um, the other problem with these bridges is that there's typically, I, I've never seen before where you put a girders on an abutment, but you don't put a diaphragm between them. So um, I thought the one good detail on these bridges was that they had a very short abutment stem and a very, very good designed slope pavement. So even though the um, superstructure fell off the bridge, it just got caught on the slope pavement. A very strong slope pavement could hold the bridge up and save lives. Um, where they did have a good, strong um, shear key, then we saw some, some kind of girder damage. But again, I think if they had an end diaphragm here, you wouldn't see any of this damage. What they did have, instead of having diaphragms, they had these um, what they called seismic bars, number six or seven embedded in pipe and connecting the bent cap to the bottom of the deck. But we really didn't understand what those things were supposed to do, and they didn't seem to provide any seismic protection. And so there was a lot of, um, a lot of overcrossings that failed. However, um, there was also tons and tons of overcrossings that weren't damaged. I mean, we drive through past 50 overcrossings that weren't damaged at all, and then we'd come to three or four that were damaged. So just like John was saying, there were areas of um, localized, high, higher shaking from this earthquake. Okay, so um, now we're going to go look at the, bridge, the river crossings in Concepcion. Um, John showed a little bit about this. Um, there's four bridges going over um, the Rio Bio Bio like John said, over two kilometers long. And every bridge was damaged, and nobody could get across the river in the center of town after the earthquake. This is the old bridge. It was closed. 
but it had so much damage after the earthquake it couldn't even be used for emergency traffic. And um, the damage was um, a lot of um, the pier walls just fell over, dropping the superstructure, steel girder superstructure. And so these um, pier walls in the weak direction, I mean, they have, I think that um, Jack and some other people came back with some um, observations that these um, pier walls and shear, shear walls in general just have to have a lot of ductility in the weak direction. So the next bridge is the Yakolan Bridge, and that's the new bridge. And basically what happened is there's all these connectors coming into the bridge, and it has a very strong, long bent where all these connectors come together. And um, you know, t basically the philosophy of Caltrans is um, everything has to be regular and balanced. And so you can't have like, a bunch of different connectors, all of different lengths, stiffnesses, periods, coming together, and what happened was all the connectors fell off of this big long bent at the start of the bridge. And so there was another bridge where no traffic could get across the river. So here's from the other side. So all these different connectors came off, and luckily they had some Bailey bridges that they could put up over them and allow one lane of traffic in each direction. Um, so, of course, so I mentioned Scout was with us, and he's a geotech. And so he was just delighted to find um, sand boils and um, um, lateral spreading, tension cracks in the soil going to the river at the Rio Bio Bio. But, and he's probably right. I mean, I'm, I don't want to argue with um, the geotechs, but um, I know um, Les Yaud and I used to work together um, and give talks. And Les said that um, when he was in Costa Rica, everybody was swearing up and down that a bridge collapsed due to lateral spreading. And um, then they took careful measurements, and they found that... Um, the distance between the abutments and the bents and everything hadn't changed, and all the damage was from shaking. So I'd say um, if you want to you talk about lateral spreading, being, bring an EDM or a tape measure longer than this one, I guess. Um, so then the next bridge, so four bridges all in a row. This railroad bridge actually performed the best. It's a Warren Truss. But again, I guess you know, they're right. There was a little bit of lateral spreading of the bank. And so um, they had to provide shoring for the superstructure. And then the last bridge is the um, Pope John Paul II bridge that um, John was talking about. And again, they're probably right. You know, I kept looking at this bridge. Well, I mean, this damage is probably lateral spreading. It could have been shaking. But definitely the problem was there was no transverse reinforcement in the columns. Um, and then I was looking at this. And why is it so wobbly? I was thinking, well, did the girders fall off? their bearings, but maybe John's right. Maybe there was um, the piles um, plunged into the soil. Okay, good. Two to go, three more, and only four minutes. Oh, my God. So Route 5 undercrossing. So we looked at the overcrossings. We looked at the overcrossings going over the Route 5, the Pan American Highway. Now we want to look at the, um, the bridges that we're going to drive over. And so um, almost every bridge had a settlement at the approach, and um, Chile's not special in that way. California has settlements at the approaches too. But these were pretty bad, and I think maybe better retaining structures, uh, maybe better compaction, and maybe use of approach slabs would um, allow people to um, access these, the highway quicker before they had to put a bunch of gravel down. Um, so the first bridge that we came to on Highway 5 coming back north is Puente Nebuco, and it's these old drop-in bridges, these reinforced concrete drop-in bridges, so you can see there's a corbel here, and then there's a drop-in span, and then there's like a table. So the bridge is like four spans like that, a table, and then a drop-in span, and then another table with little cantilever ends. Well, you can see over here, um, this drop-in span fell out. And so this was one of the big things we noticed um, during um, looking at Highway Route 5, is that they widened this bridge. So th they widened the highway. So originally it was a two-lane highway on old bridges, and so they widened it to two bridges, parallel bridges, a new one and an old one. And actually, Luis said this is an excellent um, strategy because two different bridges at two different eras, sometimes the old bridge was weaker and fell, sometimes the new bridge wasn't designed as well and fell, but they always had one bridge that was standing, so they could always detour traffic onto one of the bridges. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so at any rate, so... Looking at this damage to this um, drop-in bridge, I think that this damage was actually transverse. Almost all the damage I saw on Route 5 was transverse. 
And um, I think that these spans just moved transversely off their little corbels and fell off. Anyways, that's my, what I think, and I'm going to stick to it. So the next bridge is just the opposite. They had an old bridge, and actually it looks almost like it was retrofit of infill walls, but with s stronger shear keys and with um, diaphragms between the girders. And they had you know, one of these newer bridges where it looks like they just build them quicker and without seismic details. And so the newer bridge was closed. So it went on like that, new and old, old and new. And then, of course, over in the Rio Claro, I mean, we don't really expect unreinforced filled spandrel masonry bridges to survive big earthquakes. Um, unfortunately, um, I just had a big argument at Caltrans because there was this um, Saratoga Creek Bridge that was just like this, and it had survived the 1906 earthquake. It had survived the 1989 earthquake. I said, you know, why do you have to retrofit it? It survived the two biggest earthquakes it's ever going to see. But luckily, no one listened to me, and I was wrong, obviously. And the reason I'm wrong, I think, is um, because, you know, Ground motion is such a crapshoot. I mean, you never know. You might get the big one. You might get the little one. So um, you got to do what's right. There you go. That's my philosophy now. Oh, so quickly go through a couple more. So this is the southernmost along the coast. We didn't get very far north. We didn't get north of Concepcion, but this um, Tubal River Bridge right near the coast, and um, it collapsed. And so, you know, I'm always interested. I, I tried several times to design, develop a narrative. What exactly happened? I mean... First, the ground jerks in one direction. So does that mean that all these um, pier walls get pushed underneath the steel girders? And then, and then what? Do the girders push each other off? Or, Anyways, if you guys can invent a good narrative, tell me a narrative for that. I'd like to hear it. So sometimes, so sometimes there was some pier wall damage. Um, but in every case, the um, piers fell off. First, we were saying, is it tsunami? Is it um, lateral spreading? Is it um, shaking? And so Jack said, well, go ask the student what he thinks. So, um, so you can see every one of these things just fell off, and it looks like it was, they were pushed up over the, um, the pier seat. Oh, I'm almost out of time. Santiago Expressway Bridges. So this was a weird local. local um, when I showed this to the guys at Caltrans, they said, well, it's just like La Cienega at Northridge, you know, so far away from all the other damage um, where there used to be an old creek and soft soil. And so the, here, this is an expressway uh, loop road around Santiago where there was a lot of damage. Way north, I mean, 50 kilometers probably north of the fault. And so here's a three-span steel bridge. Not a lot of steel bridges in Chile. Again, this new versus old. The old bridge did fine. The new bridge was on shoring. Um, you can see not very good seismic details. No shear keys, um, no diaphragms. So a lot of unseating. While the old bridge is um, in good shape. So then keep, we kept on going, and we could see that um, a big sharp jolt. So one of, these, um, one of these brackets stayed on, and everything must have gone off this way. You can see where the ends of the girders smashed into the face of the bent cap. But look, one side is all still standing, so it just must have been one, one shake to did it. Oh, and so then um, most of the POCs were okay, but they weren't really designed for earthquakes, so you see a few of them were down. Um, some railroad bridges... Again, you know, I was looking at this, I was thinking this is transverse. It, the railroad runs parallel to um, the Pan American Highway. First it's on the west side, then all of a sudden it sneaks over on the east side, then back in the west. I don't know what that's about. But all transverse. So you can, I think that maybe these two columns don't have a bent cap, or maybe they just move transversely enough to drop that span over. Um, John already showed this kind of damage. And um, concluding remarks, um, designed for earthquakes, um, um, provide better detailing. Um, at Caltrans, we believe in um, regular bridges, so they all have the same period and stiffness. Um, lots of confinement, so there's, um, you get lots of damage before anything breaks. And lots of continuity. Continuity like big seats, big um, development length of bars, etc. And then your bridges hopefully will survive, or maybe I'll be proven wrong, but that's my theory.